Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in improving so many different conditions from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. Today, I want to catch you up on what some changes we're about to go through and to pick up on some really interesting uh, aspects of gut, gut evolution, and what this means to who we are and why you would even care. So to make that connection, by the way, so this is called Keto Naturopath. That's the podcast, the Facebook group, and our blog, etc. So what does that have to do with anything? Well, for those who have been following my story of the episodes we put in, not much. Didn't really want to overdo our particular story, but um, my issue was an extreme gut situation in which I saved myself from having what they call a bowel resection, having part of your large and small intestine removed and to be on a colostomy bag. So that's where I started and changing diet and it reversed a lot. And so because it had pretty profound and I got it involved in the ketogenic diet and then to a mostly meat diet, which is pretty much where we are now, the question started coming. How, as a physician, could I have missed something so obvious for, at that point, 16 years of practice? And I was at the top of my medical class and all these, I was no slouch, no dummy. So that's what began all this, asking these questions. And I certainly feel that the quality of your life is driven by the quality of the questions you ask uh, your environment, be it your neighborhood, and yourself. You have to ask questions. A lot of people don't ask questions and they're just followers. And by the way, uh, that's not to um, speak badly of people because that also exists in medicine. Most doctors are followers. They made it through medical school. They swam the ocean, so they feel, and so they're entitled to now have a practice. But unfortunately, they've stopped asking questions. Why is it a particular patient is responding, blah, 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 okay? So it's the questions, it's the questions, it's the questions. If you don't ask questions, uh, your life isn't improving. And perhaps your life is perfect right now. I, I tend to doubt it. Certainly dietarily, I tend to doubt it. So anyway, that's where I began. So that's where this began, the keto naturopath, then still go to conferences, spent years going to various conferences and microbiome initially, and then to keto and getting to know the doctors and the researchers and the reading and so on and so forth. So that's the background. That's the connection I want to make here that is very important. So when I go into gut right now, um, I'm going to be talking about, um, in essence, me. I'm answering the questions for me. But also, can we justify the ketogenic diet slash carnivore as being our diet that's really beneficial for most people? Nothing can be said that's beneficial for everybody. And that brings up another question that I have pursued. And that question is, why is it the ketogenic diet, keto, quote unquote keto, only benefits about 50% of the people who attempt it? And this isn't just somebody who attempted it in 10 minutes and decided to quit 10 minutes later. These are people who went to see, let's say, an obesity clinic and to be coached on changing their diet. And after three appointments or more, they just couldn't make it work. Why was that? Well, in part, it was because, well, they, it's, it's an unanswerable question, but I think further lab testing could have revealed a lot of possibilities. And so given that, that's where I picked up. So we 
to answer that question, we started coaching people for free. Just off, let's get going. I wanted to see a larger database of people, how they were responding to what I was considering um, the classic ketogenic diet for the most part. That's 20 grams of carbs or less, et cetera, et cetera. So we went through that with a number of iterations of these various coaching programs. Then they became chargeable. And then we started doing labs. Then we started doing more labs. And now we're up to four different panels, genome, uh, micronutrient, intercellular micronutrient levels, uh, a long uh, metabolic panel, which is blood work. And then we do a hormone panel. So it's become fascinating. So now I have answers for that, I, which is... We'll go into it another time, and I've sort of referenced it along the way, left the breadcrumbs along the way of some answers that I have discovered. And the reason I do this, because I think that it is not well served for the public, for the keto community, whatever that means, certainly when you go to um, conferences, to make it seem like everybody gets benefits. I think eventually everybody should get benefits, but you're going to make 50% of the people feel atrociously bad by saying everybody gets benefits, I don't know why you're not getting benefit, and then they're just, you know, roadkill, pushed to the side, and everybody just talks about these spectacular weight losses or something else. So those are the issues that I wanted to address. Why? When you're dealing with 50% of the people who do not get benefits, whether you're Verta Health or some obesity clinic, um, it needs to be addressed. There needs to be answers there, and that has to do with asking questions and not just being a follower of what's going on before. I uh, want to pardon that train in the background. Hope you're not hearing it as much as I am. So today we're going to come into it at a slightly different angle. I'm going to elaborate on what I've talked about before, and then I'll put some links to some uh, great presentations that I think you might, at least one presentation I think you might want to watch, and that'll be on YouTube. And you can listen to it as well, obviously. So some changes that are coming up. We're going to start a YouTube channel, and um, we actually always have a YouTube channel, but it's been no more than, let's say, Judy doing her mayo from two and a half or three or four years ago, <laughs> or something pretty small like that. So it hasn't been used. Uh, we're going to formalize it a little bit, and I'm going to do a, a weekly short YouTubes, probably seven to 10 minutes, uh, not more. And it won't be in lieu of the podcast, but the reason for doing this is that some things are visual. Some people need to see a graph. They need to see a, a an elaboration. It's hard to just talk about things if people aren't visual learners. That's what they reference. You know, if people can't visualize it, they're just left out for the whole lesson that we're trying to talk about. So that's going to be coming up. So it allowed me to go through some powerpoints and to to talk to you to elaborate on a point that I'm trying to make because this is a journey. It's my journey, and I'm really eager to share it with you and to have you know, because it really comes down to dietary changes and helping people that are been severely impacted in a bad way and need to be mended first. How's that? It's need to be mended first and then guided over to basically a low-carb diet. To that, a whole separate additional chapter of exploration is about being, I don't want to say carnivore. Carnivore is now a, I don't know if it's a patented word, but primarily a meat eater. And when I say meat, it's chicken, fish, lamb, turkey, poultry, all that. It's not just a uh, hoofed meat. And so why is that? Can we justify that? You know, and why is it my gut went from bowel resection to they can't even find the scar tissue at last colonoscopy? So that's what I'm about. And my wife has a whole different story, as you've heard before, about her um, meningioma. And yes, she did have to have brain surgery, but it was post, you know, things have improved dramatically. And she's always been from a family of diabetics, huge, obese people. And um, she's not one of them. She's pulled herself out of that genetic source. So you can't just say genes, you know, people can't say it's in my genes. And that's often what doctors tend to say when somebody is obese. So how's your, what's, what was your father like? Or what's your mother like? What's your siblings like? And they'll say, well, it must be your genes. No, it's not. Nobody has as a default genes that will predispose them to being obese or diabetic. 
they have genes that, given a bad diet, may make them gain weight faster than other people, but it's the diet that's at fault. It's not the genes that developed over many thousands of years, uh, millennia, you could say. Well, that's thousands, um, many millions of years. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Okay, so that's coming up. This is what's on deck, and let's get started. So part when we talk about the gut, you know, so that's from your mouth, right? So that's your mouth, how you chew things, how you eat things, your esophagus, your stomach, your small intestine, your large intestine, and the auxiliary organs are things like the spleen and the liver that feed into it. But for the most part, your digestive track, your alimentary canal is what I just named. So what we find, and I put uh, some of these things in the Facebook group, is that when we tend to wonder about, you know, gosh, what is, you know, there's this quandary now, what is the appropriate diet for humans? You know, whether you're from uh, Upper Siberia or the hunter-gatherers, uh, the Hunza in, the, in Africa, or the Amazonian uh, Native Americans, et cetera, et cetera, or the Inuits, How can be, you know, there's so many different diets. How can we sort of have a conversation that's saying, well, we're collectively one thing. I think we can say we are collectively one thing. And I think we get certain hints about that. But um, where you live has to do a lot with what you're going to eat for sure. And then how compatible that is. So we're going to assume for the most part in this conversation, we're not talking about processed foods. We're going back in time. So let's go back and pretend we're 500 years ago. Remove all doubt of processed foods being part of this, and then we'll go forward. Okay, so, but people wonder, you know, is it our diet? Um, Is it our digestive tract? Is it um, our genome? You know, and so what is the anthropological evidence about that? What is some of the comparative physiology about that? What does our uh, genome say about that? We're going to deal on the comparative physiology today, and um, I think it's pretty convincing, okay? So one of the things is, if you were to, this is research garnered by others, and I'll link that in the show notes. If you were to compare mammals uh, uh, post, you know, uh, post-autopsy and sort of lay out their the digestive tract, so you'd say, well, this is how, you know, how uh, how many teeth they had, um, the size of their mouth, their esophagus, their stomach, their small intestine, their large intestine, and leave it to that and say, as a comparison of that whole length of the alimentary canal, what percentage was the small intestine? What percentage was the large intestine? The large intestine also being called the colon. And what did their stomachs look like? Because we know that certain animals have very developed stomachs to, like the cow, right? The four stomachs of the cow, they chew it. They digest it, they regurgitate it, they digest it, they chew it, they digest, you know, it goes on and on. And I'll I'll get sort of to the punchline here, and that is that um, there are species that have a huge capacity to eat plants. And in order to eat plants, they needed to be able to break down cellulose. And the net objective when you break down cellulose, so let's say you're a cow, since we just talked about that bull, is that you're breaking down cellulose to produce saturated fats. Remember saturated fats for the last 70 years, you've been told not to have those in your diet. Who knows where they got that? I mean, it's Ansel Keys and we know where they got that, but that was based on a terrible lie and clearly pro-business idea. And then got into the dietary guidelines of the late 70s. Talk about that just a little bit. So anyway, so it's fermentable parts of their gastrointestinal tract, their alimentary canal, they can ferment vegetables to break down the cell walls to be able to produce saturated fats. Done. Okay, then. So let's compare some of that. So let's go back to, let's go to a comparison of what these guts look like. First of all, if we line them up and go stomach, small intestine, cecum is a small part of transition between your large intestine and small intestine. I kind of ignore that. And colon. Really, you just see one standout. You see stomachs all look to be about the same. 
remember, we're talking about the percentage of the whole track. So percentage of their GI track. So about the same amount, same percent of the GI track. It was pretty much for all the great apes, humans. Um, small intestine was a big differential. Small intestine was huge. So the small intestine for the United, for the United States, small intestine for humans was 60% of their entire track. So all from mouth to rectum, 60% was a small intestine. That's a lot. Whereas if you go to the great apes, it's barely 20%. And that's kind of a running average, plus or minus five. And so that's a big... So when we say chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, etc., they're all in there. Somewhat. Okay, so what does that say? Let's compare it to the colon. Well, the colon is huge in terms of all the apes, all the primates. And it's actually pretty small. It's less, it's around 10%, 10 or 15% in humans. So the big differential just on those two organs, stomachs by size is roughly the same. We didn't accept that. Okay. So, well, that's interesting. So what does that mean? Well, in the colon is where you actually, so the colon, otherwise known as the large intestine for most of us, is where a lot of fermentation happens on fibers. That's why you always hear the story about, oh, you need fiber. Fiber pushes your stool through and makes you have a bowel movement. Well, fiber, that's been another lie, by the way. But in terms of cellulose and fiber, that's where they get fermented, is primarily in the large intestine, in the colon. So if you didn't eat it, you didn't need it, right? So that's what we're seeing reflected in the length, the percentage length of the large intestine versus the small intestine. Um, and you can go on and on and on in that direction. What I want to go further is like, all right, let's look at, let's look at the fermentable com components comparison. So what animals, what mammals can ferment plants and what, and who can't. So everybody has some percentage, some ability to do it a little bit. So those that have the greatest percentage, and this isn't a surprise to you, think of the grazers. Think of cattle, sheep, horse. They're the top. After that would be uh, guinea pig, actually, is pretty pretty high. So they got uh, sheep, and sheep is actually the highest. Then after that, it's guinea pig, and then it's horse and cattle, and they're all about 80%. So they're marginally different, but they're all neck and neck. So then you drop down, and the pig has about um, two thirds that. And the pig and the rabbit are pretty much equal. Then you have another fall. You go down to about 13 or 14 percent, and you have three levels that are almost exactly the same. And that's the dog, and that's the cat, and that's man, as in Homo sapiens. So they're within a percentage of each other, and they're considerably smaller. So why is that? And do we have, I don't have uh, the other primates, so I'll get another, I'm looking at some slides now, but um, there's a tremendous difference in there. So we basically don't have the ability to ferment much carbohydrates, carbohydrates being plants. Okay, and nor does a cat, and nor does a dog. All right, let's go on to, where else can we go? Let me give you some numbers on that. In terms of total fermentable or fermentive, fermentative capacity. The highest capacity is sheep, cattle, horse, and guinea pig. After that, I was saying it's pig and rabbit. And to be specific, dog, cat, and human was 14, 16, and 17%. So we are almost identical to a cat and we're almost identical to a dog. So think for a second. This is the fascinating part. I don't mean this to be just numbers for you, but think for a second. You know, dogs and cats... I don't necessarily mean tigers and uh, just dogs and cats. They have been domesticated, but not really domesticated by um, they've been domesticated. They've been companions for mankind, but they haven't been domesticated. from us. So when you think of sheep, they are domesticated in the sense that we take their their wool, we take their milk, same with cattle. You know, we don't train cattle, we 
we, we have kind of a symbiotic relationship with them. We get their milk, so they've been domesticated, and we derive food from them as well as eat them, of course. And so, but when it comes to cats and dogs, at least, I'm speaking in the United States, you can say, well, China's different, but for the most part, Western Europe did not eat cats and dogs. And maybe they have to go back a century or two, maybe they did, but the point is, they are our companions. Uh, the cats came from African uh, cats that had obviously evolved, but they're African cats, primarily Egypt, and they were the first domesticated basically to clean the to keep the rats and the mice out. That was their job. So we fed them to do their job. And dogs, watchdogs, you know, they classically were watchdog or hunting dogs. So they were, we evolved with them, but we ate pretty much the same. They got the cast offs from our campfire. They got the, the leftovers of the meals got as time went through, but they ate in essence the same food that we ate. So that would explain we evolved with them, but we didn't evolve from them. So they're vertebrates, but they're not primates at all. So when you go to compare us to the great apes and to the chimpanzees, chimpanzees do eat some uh, some meat, but it is high veggies. It's fruits and veggies and some meat. The gorillas, the great apes, it's all veggies. They're in the trees. It's all veggies. So they have this huge rotund uh, abdomen to have to have that huge colon to be able to ferment and break down the cellulose to make that saturated fat. Okay, then, whereas it's man has evolved was to go eat the thing that already had the saturated fat, right? Forget about the plants, go eat the thing and get your saturated fats from what you're eating. And once they started doing that more and more, they didn't need to be able to ferment anything. So they could then not have that big abdomen. They can actually evolve from there. They could have afford a bigger brain, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of ways we can go on this, but that the cats and the dogs that were at our campfire from millions of years ago, evolved with us, but they were not of the same gene pool. So if we were to go back and say, hey, we're, we evolved from apes and chimpanzees, why are we not like them? You know, absolutely. Why are we not like them? We're not like them because we didn't evolve with them. We evolved from them, but we evolved with cats and dogs. So on a gut level, we are more like cats and dogs. Isn't that interesting? So it depends on who you evolved with and not who you evolved from. In science, they call that the difference between a genotype and a phenotype. So genetically, we are more closely related to the chimpanzee and the other, and then the great apes before that. Um, but our diet is much more in common with dogs and cats. So phenotypically, we're more like them. So hence, they're our buddies. Okay, so... Um, so what's also interesting is stomachs. Let's look at stomachs last. That stomachs are, for the most part, a similar shape up until you get to the real grazers like ox and cows and so on and so forth. But if you were to look at the size of the stomach, the, it's from man, dog, pig, and horse. They're all pretty similar. However, the stomach in terms of having its function and what it does is almost identical to a dog. So our stomachs are almost identical to a dog. They're about the same percent relative to GI as pig and horse and rat and so on, but they don't provide the same functions. Those are all much more grazers. Rats are grazers, if you will. They need to be able to ferment things, uh, horse and pig and so on. So we are pretty much an identical stomach to the dog. So it's just another verification. We're very much close to cats and dogs. So let me do a little break here. What the heck does this have to do with ketogenic diet or keto? Well, as I say, this is my journey. And the questions I'm asking is how did I miss all this? Well, primarily I missed all this because I bought into what I was taught. And I came as a naturopathic physician from a good naturopathic school, arguably the best in the country, if not the world, Bastyr. However, that was a very plant-based approach to looking at nutrition. The whole idea you needed fiber, the whole idea you needed um, uh, phytonutrients and so on and so forth. And I, I completely bought that. And so now I've just, you know, given my own healing. I didn't have a choice. I wasn't, this was not an intellectual thing for me to do. This was heal thyself, really get into it. So I get off the medications that I was supposed to be on for the rest of my life and so on. So that was the motivation here. It wasn't to 
go down a rabbit hole of interest and look at all these other research papers to come up with something interesting to say. No, that wasn't my motivation at all. I was tired of doing that to justify every little recommendation on a per patient basis or collectively the presentation I would make to other physicians. Uh, nope. Um, now it's about, let's just be real and get to the results. So that's why I'm going over all this. Our gut has a lot to do with the diet that we have. You have an appropriate diet, you'll have a healthy gut. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Let's go forward. Now, some other really interesting comparisons that sort of lines us up by saying, well, not only is keto appropriate, uh, but keto is kind of the general doorway to more specific diets. And what I mean is, so keto is low carb, right? It's keeping the carbs down. And some people say a ketogenic diet is low carb, high fat, dot, 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 and appropriate protein. And they give you their formula for the protein. I have now even disagreed with that to an extent. But it opens the door to, were we meant to be carnivores, that is meat eaters across the board with a modicum, maybe some uh, ability to digest some veggies, very small. And so there's other, when they compare, and this is a comparison, I'll put this in the the links as well. When you compare um, the length of time it takes to wean a human, that's one. When you compare the brain size relative to diet, would be another. So a uh, large brain separates humans from apes. That's facultative and intellectual differences. That's pretty self-explanatory. The human brain consumes 20% of your energy of your entire day. If you're sitting down, it's 20%. That's a big energy suck, right? Here's hoping, it, here's hoping you're putting it to good use. Okay. So human brain consumes 20% of the ener- energy at rest plants alone, plants alone could not fulfill this requirement. So for vegetarians, I don't know how they're doing it, but they're probably doing it with various concentrated products and so on. But certainly plant-based other mammals could not, did not have the caloric support surplus reserve to uh, have a larger brain. Humans became bipedal, streamlined, they could run faster, they no longer needed that big gut. Hair loss and development of sweat, that's a big difference. Um, a lot of mammals don't sweat, and certainly a lot of other vertebrates don't sweat at all. Suited to daytime persistent hunting to obtain meat with fat, marrow, brain, fatty organs. So that was some of the changes that we have seen. And so the other thing which is really interesting, now let's... I'll say that you've probably bought into that conversation. Now let me take you up to the threshold, the advent of pre-agriculture to agriculture, uh, agricultural revolution, which happened roughly about uh, 10,000 years ago to 8,000 years ago. And so, you know, now you can go through anthropology. There's plenty of fossils and plenty of skulls you can look at. What did they find? For one is there was perfect teeth. All the, can you imagine that? So now we're going back over 10,000 years ago and they had perfect teeth. Now, how is that? How is it that we do not have perfect teeth now and they did have perfect teeth then? Hmm, well, maybe something's changed. Do you think it could have been diet? Okay, so Native American skulls from U.S. and Canada uh, show this. There's no tooth decay. Wisdom teeth didn't have to be pulled. They were there. They had uh, what they call broad dental arches and big cheekbones. Um, and so one of the beliefs is that because of the fatty vitamins that you get, get through eating carnivores and fat, so on and so forth, that that was the source of their uh, fat vitamins. Okay. So that's pretty interesting, isn't it? So now let's go to an uncomfortable, pretty much current time, way up to the 1960s, 1970s. What happened then? Well, that was the dietary guideline changes specifically happened in 1977. And what do we find? Well, the recommendations were to increase your carbohydrates and drop your fats because of supposedly heart disease happening in the 50s. Remember all that? They didn't mention proteins or protein for the most part, uh, wherever they get their statistics. And I'll post post this too. Um, This is from N. Haynes, uh, which is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys of of the U.S. from 1971 to 2000. So it basically showed increased carbs, decreased fats, Protein stayed about the same, and what did we find? Everybody became obese. So you have plenty of graphs that's showing it about that time is when it started. 
You can also throw in it accelerated when uh, processed foods got into that. So there's a thing called a uh, 20 year shift, by the way. So you had the shift in eating habits and then 20 years later is when you had the rise of metabolic illnesses, primarily diabetes and um, metabolic syndrome as the various things we've talked about before. So 20 years later, so 20 years after this change happened, did you have all these other changes, ill health? So there's a 20, 20 year lag. The reason I mentioned this 20 year lag for people to start having metabolic manifestations of this very poor diet they've now been on for 20 years because they were following the dietary guideline rules is because you'll get people, and I'll say um, like a sister of mine who has certain things that are, um, I think, manifest from this. They go, well, why am I getting this now? And I didn't have it 30 or 40 years ago. Well, there's a lag time. So a big lag time. Things have to be wrong for a little bit you know, small enough so you don't pay attention to it, but large enough that that change happens over time. It accumulates over time. It's about that simple. Okay. So on that, I think that I am going to leave it that there's enough evidence there, and I'm hoping I convince you by length of our percentage of our gastrointestinal gut or alimentary canal that is almost identical to cats and dogs and the same percent of our small intestine. We have very little capacity to ferment plant-based material. And then you can throw in the comparisons of weaning times, uh, brain size relative to diet. So it's pretty convincing. So I'll put some of these links in the, uh, the images in the uh, podcast show notes. And I hope that disturbs your thinking just enough that you'll make a change. More to come. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I just wanted to encourage you to send in your questions to drgoldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Many of you have, and so what I've done with these questions that I've gotten back to most of the people I email, but some of the questions that were so good, and if they were overlapping to other questions, I would combine them and try to put that into the topic of a podcast, either via one of the micro topics that are covered in an interview. As you know, we cover a lot of topics in any given interview or some of my own sort of reporting, if you will, on some of these issues. So uh, please keep the questions coming. Feel free to send in an email and uh, I will get back to you. One thing I want to say, a number of questions have come in in which I've given this answer and the email didn't work. So just make sure that you're receiving at the same email that you sent it in. And I think that might have been the difficulty. So I look forward to your questions. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that I'm hoping to answer your questions. And I think this world of keto, it's not just black and white. You know, it's nice that it's simple, but it's not simple for some. I'm really trying to, you know, go down as anybody any of you who have listened to all my podcasts, we started way back when, history and evolution, and epilepsy, and so on and so forth. You know, now we're seeing some tremendous overlap in uh, various uh, mental disorders, such as schizophrenia or neurological disorders that are not just epilepsy. And also, just for people in losing weight, it's sometimes pretty complicated for them to engage in keto, and so they need some help. And so that's the whole point of at least that's what I think I'm doing, is exploring the world of why are there other factors? And so in exploring some of those other factors, we've covered addiction, we've covered hormones, we've covered uh, nutritional deficiencies, we've covered certain metabolic lab results, and we'll go further. We'll even get to more on genome and aspects. So these are all just contributions that make for an obstacle for some people to engage easily in the ketogenic diet. This is my belief, and these are the things that I've discovered. And I think other people have discovered some of these things, but not ever put them together. So stay listening, send in your questions, and I will definitely get back to you.